All right, Paler Hackers, with me is Pedram Shojai, founder of Well.org, a killer website, goes over all those different kinds of articles. He produced the movie Origins, which is the new documentary we're here today to talk about, and author of Rise and Shine, super busy on the internet. Great to have him here today. How you doing, my man? Fantastic. Good to be here and uh, lo- love love these types of conversations, so happy to get into some trouble with you here today. Well, trouble or or some good quality (laughs) conversations but i i had the pleasure of watching your movie origins which is a documentary um i believe you kickstarted it correct no no self-funded self-funded wow yeah well we had a we had a movie a couple years earlier called vitality and um i just took those chips and you know pushed them forward and uh you know i said look i i I like making movies this is working yeah yeah kept going okay so we have tons to dive into and i i don't even want to necessarily do um, the classic warm up 10 minute segment we do in, in most calls. I just want to get in there and, and start getting into the good stuff. So, with, with Origins, your documentary, I mean, it was very high quality, definitely set it up. Uh, you were on location shooting a lot of it and then tons of different topics. What was kind of the spark that got you going on the documentary and, and, and kind of what's, I guess, the overarching, overarching premise is getting back to the origins of uh, kind of where we come from and understanding that, correct? Yeah, yeah. I mean, when we where we kind of ended on the first documentary, uh, Vitality was just like, you know, this this conversation that happens in healthcare. And, you know, when I was doing my doctor job, it was all about like trying to fix lifestyle problems. And we we're like, look, you know, diet, exercise, sleep, mindset, get the lifestyle stuff down. And about 70% of the, you know, the stuff that st- stumbles into hospitals starts to go away. And so when we started following that, that conversation further and said, well, you know, how did our ancestors do this? Like, what was it like in Africa when we were, uh, you know, having to survive and, 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 you know, be fit and be aware and all these types of things? What was life like? What was food like? What was stress like? And how did we adapt to become so good and, and really rise up on the food chain. And so uh, basically we uh, said, let's go. Went to the first caves that our ancestors after the last ice age came out of and uh, looked at, you know, the environment. And we did, man, it was selfishly, it was, <laughs> it was awesome. It was such a fun movie to make because yeah. I got to learn to track lions and survive out there in the bush and walk amongst the big five and, and really get to understand what life can feel like when death is around the corner at all times. Um, and it really kind of triggered some really interesting kind of psychological circuitry because that same survival circuitry was how I feel. You know, I was a Taoist monk for four years, how I feel when doing Qigong and meditating. And it's like that awareness training was built into our DNA. And, you know, when we're sitting around texting at a street corner waiting sure. for the crosswalk to turn, we, we kind of lose that. Sure. And, and we're in that kind of response mindset all day. I mean, you can just pull up your Instagram, Facebook, and things are coming at you. You know, your messages are coming at you. Your emails are coming at you. You don't really take control of it, and you're not aware. It's it's almost this 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 being a awake sleep mix of where things are just happening to you, and, and you don't really have control over it. Yeah, and that's modern life, right? It's just we've kind of fallen out um, of you know that that cycle of awareness because you know a, a classic example is when we started you know like today I'm in the studio and you know we're doing a bunch of green screen stuff, but when we're out there, a camera crew out there in this primitive kind of hut like village that was there for us to you know have our solar panels and stuff because you you can go out there and survive in the wilderness, but when you take camera crews, you need a place to like charge batteries, yeah. and 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 so we're out there and then you know day one. I just kind of come out of my hut. I'm wearing flip flops because I'm a California boy, right? And um, I turn a corner, and there's this really, you know, beautiful snake, right? Like going up this tree a couple feet away from me. And me and one of the other guys are just looking at this thing, going, "Wow, look how beautiful that snake is!" An instructor comes by and goes, "Oh, wow, black mamba." And and we, you, me and the other one of my crew, we look at each other. We take a step back. And we like, oh God. First of all, why is it not black? He says, oh, that's kind of a misnomer. That's the last thing you see when his mouth opens and he strikes you and you're dead. I mean, two, you know, two to ten seconds, you're down, you're yeah. dead, you're gone, right? And uh, you know, that's if you can't get aid and you don't have it there immediately. It's, it's a deadly, deadly snake, probably the deadliest on the planet. And it was one of those things where it's like, okay, dude, pay attention because 
everything out here is new to you and you live in a world that's safe. Like I live in Southern California, you know, there, there might be a rattlesnake. I've jumped over hundreds in my, in my trail running days, but I know the danger in my environment. Now I'm in a new environment where danger is everywhere. So it's like your senses have to turn on and you become way more alive and you have to because that survivor gene turns on something really powerful in you. Yeah. Yeah. For real. And, and being in California, I mean, there's a lot of dangerous stuff, obviously, but cars are one of the most dangerous ones. And even then you have crosswalks that chirp now to tell you when to cross the street. And so everything's so organized and structured. We turn that off and, and we just go about our days. We don't really think about black mamas around the corner. Um, but I'm sure that awareness, um, that presence is kind of it's there when you travel as well. Just traveling in general. I mean, everything is so new. It's funny, you know, you look at tourists in your own town and they're taking photos of these trees that you walk by every single day. Or like totally. the tourists in your in Pike Place Market that I'm walking through, they're like stopping and watching the fish fly. And I'm just, I'm just laughing to myself because I've, I've just seen it so many times and it almost takes a new perspective for me to realize, oh, that is kind of cool. That is iconic. And when I go somewhere, I'm that tourist. I'm aware I'm, I'm in that state. So... I totally relate to that heightened sense of awareness. Yeah, and it's different, right? Because over where we were at this part of South Africa is right at the Zimbabwe-Mozambique border. There's about 900 birds that were kind of indigenous to the area. And about 100, 150 of their bird calls we needed to know because if I hear an ox pecker, it means mm-hmm. trouble. And so there's all these like alarm calls and stuff that you got to learn. And I'm not like a musician dude. So that was the hardest part for me was just tuning my ear to d- – d- they all sounded like birds at first, right? Yeah, yeah. And so tuning to the different call. And then, you know, I was – I was thinking about this going, well, you know what? Back at home, I know alarm calls real well. It's like the screeching car tires. It's the honking horn when some guy veers into your lane. And, yeah. and so our, our survival instinct is tuned to different things, but it's, it's insulated us from nature. And that's really kind of a big part of uh, the lesson we learned and, and the story we told in this movie. Okay. So you, you touch on a ton of different topics in origins, you know, mitochondria, brain health, meditation, fertility. What's kind of like the biggest couple, uh, biggest two in there that you really wanted to center um, the documentary on? Yeah. So, I mean, you go back to our ancestors and how we got to the top of the food chain and how we got real good with, you know, our cultivation of fire and our ability to kind of develop tech, if you will. Uh, We were doing really well until, you know, a couple generations ago, things started to turn. And so really the take home story is what have we done and added to our environment that's now making us so sick? making us so fat, making us, you know, have kind of disconnection with meaning and purpose and all these kind of things that were connected with day-to-day life and family and all the stuff that we had. And, and really the smoking gun is all of the chemicals that we've added to our environment, right? Um, the way we deal with food, the way we deal with, you know, air and water and all these types of things that we've kind of dirtied in uh, our better living through chemistry model has now, and, and, you know, the movie isn't just a bunch of guys tripping out in Africa. I mean, you know, the best doctors in the world are my friends and, you know, are in my movies. And so we have some serious medical evidence pointing to the fact that this toxicity is really messing us up. And so that's really the moral of the story is Mm. like, what did we do wrong? And you look at like what the early people that were trying to prove that cigarettes caused cancer and, you know, they, they were looking at all this data because so many people smoke cigarettes. They said, well, it's just as likely that nylon pantyhose causes cancer because people yeah. start using that just as often. And, you know, eventually, you know, the smoking gun was there. He said, well, yeah, maybe, maybe this is a thing and cigarettes cause cancer. What about all of the chemicals that we're dumping into our environment that our bodies have no idea what to do with and how do we back out of that without living in some sort of Ewok village and like letting go of tech like what's good tech yeah and so what kind of chemicals are you talking about just the general pollution and like greenhouse gases that we hear a lot about in politics now or are there specific gases and chemicals that we should be more aware of yeah, you know, that's a good question. And the answer, the short answer is all the above, because if it's not something that is found readily in nature, the body doesn't know what to do with it, right? So the body's evolved for millions of years, you know, or hundreds of thousands of years, you know, as, as, as humans to say, okay, well, you know, friend or foe. And that is really determined at the lining, like 70% of our immune system is lined in our gut, right? And so, 
friend or foe is something that was really typical and easy to do with bacteria and food substances and things that kind of evolved in the environment around us. Now it's like, what is red 43, right? What is propylene glycol that's found in your cheesecake? And what does the body do with it? And, yeah. and usually what we're finding is when the body's immunity gets kind of put back on its heels, uh, the answer to that question is the body freaks out. And it causes, you know, potentially autoimmune disorders. It causes leaky gut. It causes all kinds of things that, you know, all the doctors in the movie are like, dude, this is, this is a thing and this is a really bad thing. And, you know, we can say like, oh, we don't understand what's happening. But when you start looking at the environmental causes of some of this stuff, uh, there's a lot of smoking gun evidence that, you know, the stuff we've added is what's causing us to get sick. So the person out there right now, they ride their bike, they gave up their car. They're kind of shaking their fists because that it's they're not the problem in their minds, you know. I I don't drive a car, I don't pollute. I I bike to work every day, and I I gave up plastic too. I use glass, and you know I eat organic, sustainable. I shop local at my farmers market. What else do you want me to do? What right. uh, they might feel kind of defeated because here you're saying that chemicals are the biggest you know issue out there, and that we need more awareness around them. But in their mind, they've they've fixed it, and they're kind of pissed off at everyone else because they haven't fixed it so uh, what does that person do who feels like they they can't do anymore who feels like they're already contributing as much as they can yeah i would that that's a great question and i and i appreciate that because you know there are um there's the choir obviously right there's people out there that are just rocking it and doing it and for those people i would say okay just you know the the movie is all about conscious consumerism, and our and our next movie is about the conscious con, conscious capital and conscious consumerism, which is you vote with your dollars. So every time you spend your money, are you spending it on companies and people that are doing the right thing, doing you know working towards cleaning up the planet and you know kind of conserving our our natural heritage, or people that are poisoning it? And that goes all the way up to you know how you gas your car, like the, you know the guy's riding his bike now, all the way to where your 401k or your pension is being invested and looking at where your money goes. So let's just say you've done it, man. You're like standing up there and you are as clean as can be and you're squeaky clean. Awesome, great. Now get your neighbors to do the same. Get the people around you to do the same because the part where people get really bummed out and um, are feeling like defeated in this, in this model is because Washington and or wherever you're from, the, right. you know, politics has failed us in a lot of ways because they don't understand that these guys are bought. And the people, you know, and these guys are bought by the highest bidder and the corporations that are continuing these practices are doing so because they're profitable and they'll just take a percent of those profits and, you know, buy votes and buy politicians and buy policy. And so everyone's like, wow, God, it's all corrupt. I don't know what, you know. And so in the 70s, what would happen is people would just drop out and go into some commune and, you know, live that way. And what we've realized now is I don't care how far off the grid you're going to be. The brown cloud of coal and mercury and just nasty stuff that's coming over from Asia and raining down into your water source in whatever pristine corner of your, you know, Earth universe you are is getting polluted. So you got it's like it's like a, a battle cry to say, come on, stand up change the way the economy and the world is working because this is really it's it's an interesting inflection point where our survival instinct is now becoming uh, a much bigger kind of societal one and people who give a damn and are waking up to this are like okay stop you can't you know i want my grandchildren to be able to recognize a tree and not fight over you know a murky pool of water because we we killed it all right what do you say to the person then to play devil's advocate here who says, you know, technology's come so far from 10 years even, you know, we're on the internet having this conversation now with video HD. You were telling me about your 4k and you're in your studio with lights. Like you couldn't have had that in a home studio five, 10 years ago. So what's to say in five, 10 years from now, we're not going to have uh, this brown cloud of smog because we're going to have the technology to suck it out of the air, like those funnels they're they're thinking about, or those those asteroids that they can send out into space with the pollution or garbage, you know, all these crazy things that are proposed because of technology. Do you do you say that uh, we should still change our ways, even though technology is kind of exponentially increasing, and we're, we're probably going to have decent ways of cleaning it up? 
So that, that's a, a fantastic question. And um, I'm not a technophobe. I mean, I got, I got tech all around me. I run well.org. I mean, you know, that's technology's freed up my life in a lot of ways. And so, you know, there's good tech, there's clean tech, and then there's the promise of, of, uh, savior tech, if you will, which is where yeah. you're going with it. And, you know, I think Naomi Klein uh, really uh, addressed this well in her recent book. Um, and, you know, we had all this stuff where, you know, Richard Branson jumped out there and was like, you know, like trumpeting how he's going to be like the guy who, you know, changes everything and goes green and puts $3 billion into all this. And it just, and he completely faltered and failed. And, you know, mm. we followed this story. And, you know, for him, it was just a PR play and he's been polluting more than when he started talking all this stuff and as we start trying to double down on some tech that's going to save us it's like the godfather whacking people all week and then going to church and like you know give, doing a confessional asking for forgiveness yeah, it's just yeah. it's it's not a, it's not a sensible rational argument and i'm all for the tech. I mean, dude, I am so stoked. I mean, you you create some widget that like you know grabs carbon and pulls it out and pulls mercury out of the ocean. I'm all about it. But we cannot drive public policy and economies in that type of salvation model, hoping that something technological takes us out of this mess. When it's the onus is on us to just stop polluting and being idiots in the first place. So, you know, those two arguments, you know, those arguments keep being made, yeah. but I don't, I just, you know, the evidence is suggesting that if we would have done what we were supposed to do 20 years ago and slow down in polluting, we wouldn't be where we're at now, which is like this, like, like I got to put in the deed to my house and double down on this hand and yeah. hopefully I make my money back. It's just an insane way of going about like trying to preserve a, a future. Yeah. All in or not at all, and and the double down on the hand kind of rings true. I was I was getting the analogy in my head of the the person who um, just wants to gorge themselves on cheesecake, beer, soda all day, pizza, and then they hear about intermittent fasting, but it's okay, you know. So they they go 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 go, and they just take it all in, and they gain fifty pounds, but it's okay because they're just going to fast for a week and get it all off. Like we would consider that unhealthy. We know that that's not the best way to go about it. That's definitely not optimal health, but. Hey, maybe it does work in the end, but that's, I still wouldn't go there. You know, that's still going to wreak havoc on your body. It's still not the best way versus if you ate clean and prevented that, you wouldn't even have to address it in the first place. Well, that's it. And that's like the promise. That's a great example. And that's the promise of, you know, uh, bariatric surgery. Like I'm in Los Angeles, you're yeah. driving around, you have all these, all these billboards of uh, guys eating like this huge cheeseburger saying, you know what, don't worry about it. You know, we'll just, we'll just cut the fat and vacuum it out of you. Um, and that's just – it's a false promise and it's dark. It's just – that's not how reality works. And if you look at the complications of bariatric surgery, uh, it's not pretty. If you look at you know, the, the, the nutritional deficiencies and all this kind of crap that comes from it, they don't say that when they try to get your 20 grand. Um, and then yeah. the person who's inter, you know, intermittent and fasting and eating cheesecake and all that, that – you look at the cellular health, you look at the oxidative damage, you look at the, the, the long-term hit and the longevity of someone who plays that game, and they're just not going to win medically. You know, it's, it's that feast or famine, um, you know, puritanical black or white approach that we have in the West, which is, you know, I'm going to do what I will and then I'm going to do a detox, yeah. Right. Instead of just li living a good, clean, healthy life and, and being balanced all the time, we take these huge swings on the pendulum yeah. and wonder why our lives are chaotic and, and just stuff doesn't work. Yeah, we get all manic and it's either uh, we're super depressed or we're super blissful and it's just these extremes and people have a hard time regulating it. And I love the detox analogy because every time on New Year's I'm walking through the store and boom, there's a celebrity box with the seven-day cleanse. And if you do the seven days, you can look like Kim Kardashian and have her ass on, the, on there because it's great and you have seven days. And I'm like, is there anybody out there that has ever done a seven-day cleanse and looked like that? No. Yep. What did the last seven-day cleanse do for you? Nothing. You made it to day four and it still didn't work. You know? Totally. But yeah. here's my 400 bucks. Here's my $400. And it feels like they get more expensive and more expensive and more expensive. And uh, the promises get bigger and bigger and bigger. And it's that magic pill, which I think goes back to kind of what we were just talking about in terms of savior technology. You know, we have those savior hacks or savior detoxes that we want for our health and our longevity and the shortcuts. And, and maybe, um, 
the the theme of a call, I guess, like this, have been saying, no, we got to get back to our origins and we got to find ways to uh, do more preventative, sustainable, long term methods instead of trying to find these hacks and 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 take shortcuts. Yeah, man, and it's just. You know, we fell into this. I spent years as a monk learning that, you know, desire was kind of the root of human suffering. And then getting into business and running, you know, large successful businesses, you realize that marketing is all about taking people's desires and judo flipping them, making them feel like crap so that you get the money out of them. And so if you start following the smoking guns of like how industry works and how we're kind of just led to become blind, stupid, ignorant consumers, you look at this this trail of of just filth. I mean, how many shoes do you need coming over on on containers from China that's, you know, digging coal out of the ground and, and just destroying our planet? And at what point is enough enough? And so, you know, the entire economy is based on a consumption based economy. And, yeah. you know, we're at a point now where we need to have a fundamental rethinking of this. And look, I'm not coming at your, your audience here as like some sort of like weird uh, communist, uh, you know, communist economy guy. You know, I'm a, a monk, I'm a doctor, and I'm a father who's concerned about the future of our planet, right? And so that's why I got into making movies, uh, kind of telling the story for the side of Mother Earth. Because, you know, without nature, we're hosed. And that, you know, nature is really kind of like an externality on the e- economic spreadsheets of, of a lot of these business models. And, uh, you know, that's been where we've paid the highest price as a society is like, oh, well, you know, who cares about the coal burning, you know, in the sky? That's the sky is a, a, a asset of, you know, all of ours that we can pollute and the cost of cleaning it up doesn't belong to the polluters. And that's a huge issue. What's the kind of the premise? You've said it a couple of times, but about... uh conscious consumption and, and kind of conscious capitalism and um, how we can vote with our dollars and, and all that's wrapped up into it. So I, I'm curious on what your take is on that topic. Yeah, sure. I mean, look, you could, um, I'm in California and a lot of the citrus that we get, and I'm I actually, I'm, let me do one, do you one better. I'm in a place of California called Orange County yeah. and it used to be covered in orchards that, you know, basically grew oranges. And then someone decided that Florida is a better place to grow oranges. So you know, now there's just a bunch of houses in Disneyland over here, right? And we get our oranges from Florida, which means we're paying ExxonMobil or Shell or some, you know, petroleum guy to ship it. We're paying a bunch of chemical companies to fertilize and do pesticides and all this kind of crap. And then it comes over and then we pay this huge margin because, you know, the grocery store has all of, you know, these oranges lined up on these, you know, these trays and whatever it is. And so that's how I get my oranges. And they were probably not even ripe before they got onto the the containers and the, and the, the, the cargo thing. And so whatever happened to getting you the oranges either from your yard or the guy down the road that grew the oranges and not spending all that money on petroleum? Whatever happened to incentivizing the guy who is doing farming practices that don't kill the environment uh, and cutting out all the middlemen so that the people who are actually, you know, touching the food and doing it in the right way um, have, a, a, you know, money for their families and, and, and have a, a livelihood doing one of the most noble things they can do, which is growing food. And, and so that's just one example, right? But, you know, companies that are polluting, like I just, I'm very careful about where I spend my money hmm. because I know that what I'm doing is effectively giving them power. And so if you're, giving your money to a company that's buying lobbyists that are trying to convince your elected officials to vote against your best interest, then you're feeding the very machine that you are you know, saying you're opposed to, right? And yeah. so it's a very, very uh, interesting cycle that you got to look at. And it, it is kind of one of those things that people almost roll their eyes about when you start talking about corporations. Like even that word corporations, it's like, Oh great. A conspiracy theorist right here. Right. He's going to tell me how the government man is, you know, stifling creativity and we all need to go in the forest and do LSD. But and these conspiracy theorists kind of get that stigma towards them. Yep. But when you start peeling it back, there really are some messed up practices going on right now that are very, 
uh, out in the open, transparent, but we seem to not care because we put them in the conspiracy box and, and we shut them out and, and we're rational people and the irrational people only care about that. So that's our justification for still shopping at Walmart and buying cheap shoes from China. Yeah, yeah. And, you know, it's a very interesting thing. You know, I, I um, you know, was good friends with one of these conspiracy guys for a while. And, you know, nothing mattered because he could say whatever he wanted because, you know, it's like Terrence McKenna said, give me one free miracle. Like, I explain everything. And it's absolutely uh, infuriating to see some of this crap that's being put out there by conspiracy theorists. But it's also infuriating to see how, um, stuff that has tons of evidence is being chalked up as conspiracies because it's a really good defense by people that have PR firms and armies of lawyers and all these types of things to basically make people get confused, stay confused and, and, and kind of establish or keep the status quo because guess what? In the status quo, certain people are paid, man. They're making great money and you know, they're in a position to be defensive of the money that they're making because, you know, it's a, they have the money and they can, and B, you know, it's why not, you know, why, why carve in when we had this, like, you know, this thing to, you know, label GMOs, they know that eventually they're going to lose this battle, but they're going to keep rocking it until they do because the margins are there. Right? It's like, why would we give up money that's flowing in right now by consumers that we've fooled through, through media and all this? And, you know, yeah, anyone who talks, you know, anything different is a conspiracy theorist. You know, I don't, I don't do, I don't cite anything that doesn't have evidence because I'm a physician, right? And so when we start looking at what's happening and then we look at some of the defenses of, of, you know, the industry coming out, it's really primitive. But you look at the, the mentality and the psychology of the mob and you realize that it's worked since Caesar's time. And so you got to like, as a, as a informed or, you know, this, the, the entire, uh, political system in America is set up around an enlightened citizenry. That means you know what's going on. So as an enlightened citizen, you look at things and you think critically instead of like, oh, you know, that's, that's, that's a conspiracy or that's, you know, this or that. And, you know, nothing is black and white, you know, you just got to look at evidence and, and, and think, in this modern era and, and people have been trained to stop thinking. You got to pick and choose. I remember my grandma, um, she would always be the epitome of like the crazy conspiracy chicken lady. You know, she had like 20 chickens and that's all she cared about and everything to her, the sky was falling and there was conspiracies all around us and I love her. And she has some of the most entertaining conversations and I love the heck out of it. Cause she, she there, she's so informed. She's like too informed. Um, but this is my point is I think once you believe one quote unquote conspiracy, there's a tendency that box is open. So you're more susceptible to believe them all. Um, yep. And I think a lot of people go down that path and lose all credibility because, you know, they think all because they think GMOs are bad. Now, all of a sudden, um, you know, the vaccinations are killing my kids and uh, 9-11 was an inside job and, you know, Kennedy was whatever you want to get into. Yeah, it's, it's all or nothing. It's all or nothing. And so it's that pendulum we just talked about and there's no balance in there. Um, so these hot ticket items that get labeled conspiracies, what's your approach to them? You know, whether it be GMOs or even vaccines, I mean, not like just yay or nay on them, but what, sure. how do you view those hot ticket items being a physician and trying to look up things objectively? Yeah. I mean, we just did uh, a show on uh, vaccines and, you know, my, my co-host is a Harvard trained medical doctor and, you know, I've been, I'm, I'm more on the Eastern side. I'm a, you know, Oriental medical doctor. And, you know, so w when push came to shove, you know, I got a 11 year, 11 month old, old baby and you know we're talking about what vaccines I'm okay with and what not and yeah. then people started like flipping out saying I can't believe you're vaccinating your kid I was like hold 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 on right I'm not building a death star here right I'm a sensible parent who doesn't want polio for their kid who's studied that stuff now what's the other side of that argument is like, okay, they're putting mercury, they're putting aluminum, they're putting all sorts of stuff in the vaccines, they're escalating the, the you know, and so there's, there's a, a place for discourse. And what happens is everyone just gets really polarized. It's just like, either you're with us or against us. And yeah. that's, you know, that's dark side, man. That's, that is no way to have an intelligent conversation about anything. But that's how the media wants to pull people into kind of mob mentality of, you know, you know, with us or against us. It just, 
it's not a, a sensible, rational approach. And so for me, you know, we brought on, um, you know, the guys, you know, some of the, the anti-vax people, we're talking to the pro-vax people and we're trying to set up a discourse and that has to happen everywhere. You know, it's like, I'm looking at the evidence of GMOs, you know, Jeffrey Smith was, you know, talking to me about it the other day. And I talked to a couple guys over at Berkeley and, you know, we're talking to serious scientists on both sides saying what, what is happening and, you know, my approach to that, just to, to not kind of sit in the middle and not have, you know, I'm not a politician, is nature has been where we have thrived. That's where we, you know, the Origins movie was all about. We come from nature, we did well with nature, and since we've taken a departure from nature, a lot of these disease processes have emerged. Now, we may or may not understand the mechanism of what's happening, but what we can see is that the closer our diet and our environment and our lifestyles are to that of our ancestors and where they derive nutrition and air and water and all those types of things, the better our patients t tend to be doing and the better our, our food system and the earth and, and kind of the, the, the water systems tend to do. So yes, we're studying it. But I'm not going to wait 20 years for industry-sponsored studies to say one way or the other. I'm not going to live under power lines, and I'm not going to eat GMO and you know, yeah. modified foods because guess what? My body doesn't recognize them, and if it does and we figure it out down the line that this new chemical is great and you know, our bodies are okay with it, fine. But the preponderance of evidence for me is with history – and history has us living with nature way longer than up to the 50s when all of a sudden we started getting sick and killing the planet. So it's just – it's a sensible way of looking at it for me and then we look at it scientifically from there. Yeah. But you know, if it ain't working, back up. Go back to what was working and then slowly start looking at things on a case-by-case -case basis. I see. OK. So nature has a, the better track record and that's kind of what Origins went into and, and, and had it there. And I mean you know – to bring it dip back into conspiracy land, a lot of the studies now are funded by people who have their uh, incentives in one or the other camps, and they want the studies to go a certain way. And I mean, you name it, any study out there, probably uh, the the big ones that we get uh, caught on. It's hard to do an objective research piece now because either the peer reviews are are messed up, or the researchers are you know incentivized because they want a certain result otherwise it's not really a popular study or you know there's just all kinds of little things that add up and like little people kind of passing along the message that it gets a little more uh, construed and 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 mixed up and not the original so well and, and you just on that point real quick because i think you're on something very powerful and this is kind of like you know it's going to be like university gate and it's going to come out in the next few years more and more is that there's plenty of wonderful scientists in very, uh, you know, illustrious positions in great universities that would love to study some of this stuff, but it's career suicide. Yeah. The, the patrons and the donors that are funding these companies, uh, funding these universities are saying, this is what you can look at acceptably and this is where you don't touch. And so there's a de facto communication saying, this is the direction we're driving science. This is what you're allowed to look at. And good science looks at everything objectively, but the, the money ain't there, man. Sure. And, and the person who's, and if you follow the money, um, it ain't a conspiracy. It's just the money is being driven by industries that have a vested interest in, in, in kind of keeping their version of quote unquote science in the forefront. And, and even then, like, you know, the studies just are, 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 they're lame. They're not even proving that their stuff works. It's just, it's a hoax. Yeah. I had an aha when you were talking. It was, uh, you know, we have these universities and these people, these researchers in the lab coats, and we almost, speaking of savior technology, we almost view them as the savior, um, inventors and 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 pushing the technology forward and it's not our job to do that well now we're seeing you know the apple watch coming out given it's 20 grand or whatever right if you want the gold one but you can become your own scientist and the tools are there for you today integrating technology into your life that these stupid phones that we carry around everywhere that are second brains can now be your little lab and you can be your own scientist, whether you have tests or data or you order it from a site or, or whatever. Um, so we don't need to kind of put our, our faith in these university or scientists as much as we maybe once did in the past. 
Well, they have to earn it back. Um, you know, a lot of trust has been breached because, look, if you're a hired gun for Dow Chemicals, then you're going to you're going to kind of toe the line or, or you know and this happened a lot with like you know scientists that came out that were you know looking at fracking yeah. and you know every single one of them that was like hey this is kind of a bad idea and it's polluting somehow <laughs> got fired and we're gone so if your scientist is only the guy that's going to like you know put on red lipstick for you and dance then that's a prostitute it's not a scientist and so we're not we're not interested in that kind of science and so look I'm a scientist I love science show me the evidence but show me all of it yeah it's select, it's political man it's just it's bs so we got to we're we're wrapping it up and I want to leave the listeners without um, doom and gloom and definitely checking out origins i think is a good good place to start and that documentary was really well produced i was surprised that it was so um self-produced and it didn't look it didn't look self-produced at all you know um it was very professional and so kind of i'm, I'm curious real quick what was the process of making that documentary outside of just the content of it like the you know the either the production or the filming or the traveling like we touched on it a little bit but i'm sure it was a bigger process than people think oh man it's it's a hell of a lot of work you know it's uh, you know first of all we spent a lot of money um which makes it a beautiful movie and i i have very you know kind of uh quality filmmakers that worked on it so you know it, it wasn't produced on an iphone you know we had hd yeah. cameras uh, hd cameras out there tracking these lions um and you know it was done in a way it took, it took us four years because you know telling the story of origins was a challenge because we are talking about where we came from biologically and where we're at now and reconciling it into a, a, a positive, enthusiastic, hopeful vision for our future that includes personal responsibility and, and, and our personal stake in all this. So yeah, I'm not a doom and gloom guy at all. I know we kind of went in that direction a little bit on our call, but it's fun. Man, it's I, fun. I've, well, it's just, you know, it is what it is and you got to know what you got to know what you're up against. But yeah. at the end of the day, you know what the the problem with our society is that the individual consumer, the person who's listening to this right now has been duped into thinking that they're powerless. And every single time you make a decision to direct your money to people who are supporting the right things and not the people that are using your money to lobby against you, you have been a part of the problem and uh, a, a part of the solution and not the problem. And so the movie was uh, an incredible, incredible uh, journey for me. You know, a lot of the top doctors in that movie are friends of mine. And, you know, we all feel this way. And, and you know, we've been stuck in a model that's kept us being kind of the mash unit for people coming in, just feeling worse and worse year after year. And at some point you start looking and saying like, what happened? Why is it that all of a sudden everyone's getting sick and depressed and infertile and, and all these problems are showing up and you start tracing back to you know the, the killing of the microbiome and the killing of our, our mitochondria and, and you know the, the pulling away of the tryptophan so our brains aren't working right and the farming practices and the chemicals, you're like, holy crap, this is actually a thing and the solution to it is simple, Right. Eat natural food that comes from the earth. Get out there and do primal movements. Move and get sun like our ancestors did, right? And just cleaning up the supply chain that goes into your body, cleans up your body and your mind and, and, and builds that vitality so you could have the enthusiasm to be uh, someone who's pulling for team earth and team human and not someone who's helping you know, build a Death Star for a couple companies that are just getting paid in the shade right now. So, Pedram, what do you think is one or two things a person who just watched this call or listened to it on, on audio on iTunes can go out and do today to really make a difference, whether that be with conscious capitalism or health or kind of anything we talked about? One or two things. Yeah, sure. First is find your local farmer's market or CSA. Change the way you get your produce um, so that it's a natural, organic, local source and start a garden if you have you know, the means to do so and connect back up with food. Food is one of the most uh, uh, powerful ways of doing that. And then number two, and this is again on the health side, is – Go through your pantry, go through under your sinks, look at all the chemicals that are in your world 
and start swapping them out for non-chemical alternatives from cleaning products to cosmetics to deodorants to all that kind of stuff. And you know, in a few months, all of a sudden, those rashes start going away. Uh, you know, you start feeling better. All sorts of really interesting things happen when you stop poisoning the body. Awesome, Pedram. And well.org is a killer site. Uh, you got tons of articles on there, everything from money to health to nutrition to exercise, um, environmental stuff. And uh, is that is that the best place to find you at, well.org? That's it, man. That's home. You know, yeah. I'm working on a new book right now, uh, working on a movie on Conscious Capital and a new TV show, but it all like it all goes through well.org and We've been busy, you know. We're trying to we're trying to do our part, and our whole thing is we put our cameras on the good guys, and we want to tell the stories of the people that are making a difference on our planet. Origins, the documentary, uh, was it Origins.com? Origins the movie? Origins film. Originsfilm.com. Origins film. Links in the description down below, guys. Check it out. Great movie, killer movie. Uh, Pedram, thanks so much for coming on the show, man. It was a blast talking with you, and I think the listeners got a lot out of it. I I sure did. It was a fun conversation. I hope so. I love this stuff, man. Thank you. Thank you for doing what you're doing. And this is this is important work. So you got Clark, you got a great, great thing going here. Awesome, man. Appreciate that. Later, man. Cheers. Cheers.